Welcome to today's webinar, Staying Out of Due Process in Special Education, Five Timely Do's and Don'ts with Julie Weatherly. I'm Clay Whitehead, the co-CEO and co-founder of Presence Learning. We provide live online speech therapy, occupational therapy, and counseling services for special needs students. We have a great webinar in store for you today with Julie. She's one of our favorite presenters here at Presence Learning, and I know that she's looking forward to answering your questions after the presentation. Today, Julie is kicking off our Fall SPED Expectations series of webinars, which will also feature Dr. Barry Prezant on taking a family approach in special education, and Dr. Alan Coulter, who will be speaking with us about the impact of results-driven accountability. If you have any questions for Julie during the webinar, please submit them in the chat box, and she will answer as many of them as time permits following her presentation. We have a fantastic crowd here today. We're excited to have almost 2,000 educators and clinicians joining us to hear Julie. It includes Dixon Deutsch of the New York City Special Education Collaborative and New York City Charter Schools as well. We want to extend a special welcome to them as partners in this webinar. We also want to welcome some of the many school districts that are joining us today. Appalachia Intermediate Unit Number 8 in Pennsylvania, Atlanta City Schools in Georgia, Bryan County School District in Georgia, Cherry Hill Public Schools in New Jersey, Chicago Public Schools in Illinois, Jefferson Parish in Louisiana, Lee County, Mississippi, Little Rock School District in Arkansas, Loudoun County in Virginia, Palmdale School District in California, and Pulaski School District in Arkansas. We also invite you to join us on Twitter using the hashtag SPEDAHEAD. Today's webinar includes a handout providing more details about the cases Julie will discuss. A link to the handout was included in the reminder email that you received, or you can download it at plearn.co slash jww hyphen handout. That's p-l-e-a-r-n dot co forward slash jww hyphen handout. The key icon on the slide, the yellow key icon along the left that you'll see, gives you the corresponding handout page so that you can follow along. And now I'd like to formally introduce today's speaker, Julie Weatherly. Julie is the founder of RISE, which consults with and provides legal services to public school districts and education agencies on special education law. Julie is a widely sought after speaker for conferences and workshops. She has appeared on 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl and has been recognized by the National Case Organization for Outstanding Service. Without further ado, Julie, it's all you. Thank you very much, Clay, for that lovely introduction. And I also would like to thank Presence Learning for the opportunity to present this webinar today and to be a part, at least part one, of a three-part series that I know will be very, very beneficial to the educators who are listening out there. Let's get started on our staying out of due process in special education, five timely do's and don'ts. By way of background and setting this up so that you will understand the five that I've chosen to discuss today, I want to talk about the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in rally, first and foremost recognizing that the IEP is the modus operandi as it relates to the provision of free appropriate public education to students with disabilities. Now, the Rowley case, if any of you ever studied education law and special education law was a part of it, you will know that this was the seminal Supreme Court case issued in 1982, and it is referenced in my materials as the Board of Education of the Hendrick Hudson Central School District versus Rowley case, but often known as Rowley. And the reason this case is important for a number of reasons, but the primary reason that Rowley is known as an important case is the establishment by the court of what's known as a two-fold standard for determining whether a school district has offered free appropriate public education. And within that standard, it's required that the IEP is analyzed using this two-fold analysis. In your materials, you'll note that I have bolded the two-fold analysis set forth by the court. And the court said that any time a due process hearing officer or a court is looking to whether or not the school district has offered free appropriate public education, two questions must be asked and answered. The first question is, has the school district or state complied with the procedures set forth under the Act, or now we know to be the IDEA? 
the first question being, has school folks followed the process set forth under IDEA? And I call that the process piece of the Rowley standard. And then the court goes on to say, and secondly, the question to be asked and answered, is the IEP developed in accordance with those procedures? Is it reasonably calculated to enable the child to receive educational benefit? And that is the content prong of the Rowley two-prong analysis. So I call this process and content, and the reason I think it's important to start our discussion today with respect to this particular standard is so you'll understand why four of the five do's and don'ts we're going to talk about today deal with process. As I've explained in my materials, you'll note that there have been courts that have found a denial of free appropriate public education based solely on a process or procedural error. So much so that actually in 2004, Congress amended the IDEA to deal with this because there were so many courts that were finding process violations sufficient to find a denial of faith and not even looking to the content or quality of the IEP that was developed in accordance with the process. So being a little bit concerned about that, Congress established what I call a no harm, no foul standard that I reference in your materials in the indented quote, the actual language that we saw, new language in 2004 said that not every single process or procedural error is in and of itself a denial of free appropriate public education. Rather, a court or a hearing officer has to find one of the three things relative to the procedural error, that it either actually impeded the child's right to free appropriate public education or number two, that that procedural error significantly impeded the parent's opportunity to participate in the decision-making process regarding the provision of fate to the child. And you will notice there that I have bolded that one because it is very, very important. Most of the procedural errors that constitute a denial of fate have been found to deny fate because they have impeded the parent's opportunity to participate in the decision-making pro process. And number three, the law now says that the process violation must be found to have caused a deprivation of educational benefits, so that it was really a harmful procedural violation. Congress, again, was concerned that too many times courts were just relying on prong one of the rally standard. But it's still very important to focus on process, and again, four of the five that we're going to talk about today are procedural in nature. So let's move to our five timely do's and don'ts for discussion today. The first one I might refer to as the numero uno procedural violation. Every court that has looked at and found a predetermination of placement has found that that in and of itself constitutes a denial of faith, so much so that the court won't even look to the quality of the IEP that was developed. They only look at the fact that there was predetermination of placement. So what does predetermination mean? Let's look at this don't. Number one, don't engage in action that appears to be a, quote, predetermination of placement. And I always ask folks to highlight predetermination of placement that's in quotes. It's a catchphrase in special education law. There is nothing that parent attorneys like better than to find that something was done that constitutes a predetermination of placement. Or in other words, that process violations somehow denied parental input into educational decision making. Now this one is very, very important. In fact, segment two of this webinar series that's going to be conducted by Dr. Barry Prezant actually talks about this as a theme in terms of working with families and collaborating with them to make decisions and to avoid ultimately predetermination of placement. Within each of these do's and don'ts, I will talk to you about some practical scenarios. Now, please understand, I know none of these things would ever happen in your school district, but I think it's important for us to make this a little bit more practical. So let's look at our first potential scenario, our first practical scenario. Let's say that school staff all meets together prior to the scheduled IEP meeting, completes and signs the IEP, 
handing it over later to the special education teacher because, after all, she has more time on her hands, and she can sit with the parent and go over with go over it with them. And after all, all we need, really need is their signature on this thing, right? Or similarly, and in the same vein, let's say school staff all arrive together. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. It's so good to see you again. Have we got a deal for you? Here's the IEP. It's all ready to go. All we need for you to do is sign it. We'll be up the hall in our rooms. We've got a few things to do. But if you have any questions, please let us know. Anything that looks to the parent that you have already, the educators have already got this figured out. We've got the IEP all ready to roll. Here we need you just to read over it, sign it if you have any questions. Something that creates in the minds of the parent the perception, which is easily done, the perception that we really didn't need to have you here today. Now, often this doesn't happen, hopefully, but let's talk about a few questions that come up with respect to this particular issue. The first question that I have as noted here on this slide and in my materials, what about preparing drafts ahead of IEP team meetings? This was actually litigated for the first time before a U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. The First Circuit actually carved into this issue in 1991, GD versus Westmoreland, that was the case, where the parent attorney argued that in and of itself, the development and bringing a draft of an IEP to an IEP meeting was legally a procedural violation. And the court said absolutely not. The drafts many times are expected. Drafts are for preparation only. But it's all about how that draft is presented to the parents. If the draft is plopped down in front of the parents as a final document and all we need to do is have the parent read and sign it, then that's going to be perceived to be a predetermination of placement. But completing a draft I would say 99.9% .9 of parents would appreciate that someone gave some thought to things ahead of time. So the case law has been very clear that drafts are clearly not a violation in, the, in and of themselves of the IDEA's procedural requirements. In the handout, too, you'll also note some regulatory commentary from the U.S. Department of Ed that was issued in 2006 alongside the regulations that ultimately came out. And the USDOE was actually asked by some advocates to outlaw drafts, to tell educators that they could no longer ever bring anything in draft form to an IEP meeting. And the USDOE's response, as noted here, was, you know, we're not going to do that. But it's interesting to note that the USDOE does say within this quotation, we don't encourage public agencies to prepare drafts prior to IEP meetings, particularly if doing so is going to inhibit a full discussion of the child's needs with the parent. And that's what they're pointing out here is that it's okay to draft things as long as you go through a process to ensure that parents are entirely a part of the decision-making process. They actually go on further in this, in this quote to note that if a school agency does have a policy or procedure of developing drafts, such as a draft IEP, draft goals and objectives, draft student profiles or present levels, that those should be shared with the parents ahead of time to give them even more opportunity to be a full participant in the upcoming meeting. Let's look at our next slide, another question that comes up. What about the use of computerized IEP programs? You know, I hate to admit it, but I've been around long enough to remember the days when we used to handwrite IEPs in longhand. And wow, they were brutal, but I will tell you a lot more thought was given to IEPs and the individual needs of children back then. Now we've all gone to computerized IEP programs, regardless of the computer software program you use. And while, of course, those are not illegal by any means, we have to be real careful to train staff in how to use these computerized IEP programs, such that nothing looks predetermined. I like to tell educators, particularly teachers who develop IEPs, I like to tell everyone, let's think outside the drop box. I can't tell you how many times I've had a situation where I'm attending an IEP meeting on behalf of the school district, and a parent says, I'd like for the team to consider this alternative. And the teacher's over there clicking on the program saying, oh, I'm sorry, that's not an option in our program. The problem with that is, via the use of the computerized program, something is predetermined also can lead to a mindless IEP, as the Roland M case called it. The Elmhurst situation that's listed in your materials also was a little 
unfortunate because the computer-generated IEP contained the name of another child, and there is nothing worse uh, in terms of some sort of predetermination looking cut and paste when using a computerized IEP program. Also be sure that if your IEP contains, because of computer program, some coding or some uh, things that really are not necessarily comprehensible, symbols, things like that, that parents may not understand, they could argue that they really were not a full participant in the process because they truly didn't understand what was going into the IEP. We need to be careful with the use of computerized IEP programs. All right, let's look at our next scenario. Let's say during the IEP meeting, the regular ed teacher exclaims, but in our meeting yesterday, I thought we decided that she was not going to participate in the regular program. Oh, boy. So we have a teacher who attended a pre-IEP meeting, staff meeting, who was under the impression that a final decision was made with regard to the student's regular education participation. Well, nothing makes the eyes light up brighter on the parent's attorney's face than to hear that there was another meeting held before the IEP team meeting. Case in point, the Spielberg case. Now, understand there are a lot of cases that are examples of everything I'm talking about today. So the ones I've included in my materials are just some of my select favorites. Spielberg case is a favorite of mine. Uh, primarily because it keeps me up at night sometimes. I wake up in the middle of the night and thank goodness this did not involve me. Long story short, this involves a letter written by a school attorney who wrote to the parent attorney, and the letter said something to the effect, this is just a reminder, we'll be meeting next Tuesday for that IEP meeting, but before we get there, just want to give you a heads up. The school staff has already met, and the, they've decided the child's program will be X. And we will not discuss Y, Z, A, or B. Sincerely yours, see you next week. Well, this is something you don't want to have happen as a school attorney, that your own letter is exhibit one for the other side, which is exactly what happened here. In fact, the court case, the court actually took the letter and reprinted it in the decision and said this was clearly a fatal procedural violation. And because of it, it constituted a denial of fate sufficient in and of itself to find in favor of the parents in that case. The court was faced with an argument from the school board attorney who said, okay, well, if this was a predetermination of placement, that's not what's really important here. What's important is the quality of program X that was actually proposed for this particular child. The court said, we don't care about the quality of program X. We have answered the first prong of the rally decision, the process question, we have answered that in the negative. You committed a fatal procedural sin in holding the meeting, and school board attorney, your letter is exhibit one for that. The Doyle case, some humorous language here, the court said, while you don't predetermine placement, you can talk about things ahead of time. School officials must come to the IEP table with an open mind, but this doesn't mean you come with a blank mind. So courts do acknowledge you're going to do some preparation ahead of time, but not to the point where a regular ed teacher says, but I thought we already decided that placement issue before we got here. In 1999, there was a request of the U.S. Department of Education by many educational groups to clarify a little bit better what actually constitutes a meeting to which we must invite parents. And in my materials, you'll see some IDEA regulatory clarification. It's still in the regs today, but for the first time came out in 1999 because we were always worried about, well, can we ever meet ahead of time? Is that just dangerous? Should we not even talk about the child at the water fountain in the morning? Um, so because of that level of paranoia, the USDOE decided, okay, we'll clarify this a little bit. And you'll see the regulatory provision that clarifies what a meeting actually is to which we must invite parents. A meeting does not include informal or unscheduled conversations involving school personnel and conversations on issues like teaching methodology, lesson plans, coordinating services, and that kind of thing. And importantly, the regs go on to say that a meeting also doesn't include any preparatory activities that school personnel might engage in to develop a proposal or response to a parent proposal that will be discussed with them later at a meeting. So it's very clear that the regulations contemplate preparatory activities, such as preparatory meetings. And I will tell you as a school attorney, 
nothing is worse than members of IEP teams coming to the meeting unprepared, particularly in a potentially adversarial situation. There needs to be a good level of, pre of preparation, but not to the point where we have been told what we are going to do the next day. We only develop agendas, and we talk about options that might arise and questions a parent might ask and be prepared for those, but the final decisions are to be left for the IEP team when the parent has been given the opportunity to participate. A couple of others in, these category, in this category that are self-explanatory. Let's say the principal says during the meeting, oh, but the special ed director already told us that we can only recommend X. You can fill in that blank. Or someone says, the team recommends these services, but these will have to be approved by the principal. Well, nothing worse than someone on the outside who's actually directing what the decision is going to be either the special ed director or a principal who has the final say. The IEP team is to be prepared with the parent to make the final recommendations as to what is going to be in place for a particular student with a disability. Here's another example. The LEA representative at the meeting introduces the IEP team members. So we're in the introductory phase of the, the meeting and afterwards says, and we're here today to develop an IEP for Billy to go to the self-contained class for LB students, and we won't discuss anything else. Well, there we have it. In the introductory statement to the meeting, the assistant superintendent, as in the Barry case, made the proclamation essentially that this is what we're going to do today, and this is going to be the placement. If I'm attending a meeting such as this, and believe you me, I have, I might serve as a facilitator myself and actually facilitate the school folks out of that situation by saying, well, don't you mean that that's just one option we're going to talk about when we get to placement during this meeting? We have a whole lot of work to do. I do want to point out the RL case. It's a brand new case out of the 11th Circuit, which is where I practice in the Florida, Georgia, Alabama area. But here an LEA representative showed up at the meeting and essentially cut the parents off as they tried to talk about options. And because of that, the court said that clearly was a predetermination of placement. Again, a fatal procedural sin. All right, let's look at our next one. Taking the private evaluation report that the parents brought to the meeting and shaking it in the air, the school psychologist says, but you've got to be kidding me. This guy's a quack, and we're not even going to consider this report. I actually was in a meeting one time where the school psychologist ripped the private report in half and said, I don't read anything this fellow writes. <laughs> and I think I recall asking for someone to go get us some tape so we could take, tape it back together and consider it. And that's the important part, considering as part of parent participation, what they bring to the table must be considered, not necessarily incorporated into the recommendations of the ultimate team decision or into the IEP itself but considered. For instance, in the DeBuo case, the Fourth Circuit case in 2002, the special ed director slid the private evaluation reports the parents had brought to the meeting, slid them across the table to the parents and said, we're not even going to consider these. And it would have been nice if that procedural violation didn't exist at all in that particular case. So we need to train everybody that we are going to give full consideration to any input that parents bring to the table though we know that we don't necessarily have to incorporate that input into the ultimate IEP. All right, now let's move to our second do or don't. This one is very important as well. Do make educational recommendations or decisions based upon the individual needs of the student and nothing else. This is the I and IEP and the I and IDEA, the individual. This is a little bit of a form of predetermination, but it's a little bit different angle, a little bit different analysis, and that's why I carve it out as a, as a second do or don't, because it's very, very important. If a court sees something that looks as if the educators did not make a recommendation or decision based upon the individual needs and that something else was the driving force, that in and of itself can constitute a denial of free appropriate public education. So let's look at our practical scenarios. Our first one, and again, I know none of these things would ever happen in your school district. Well, mom, he might need that, but I'll be honest with you, we just don't have that here. Well, okay, here's the problem. The parent attorney is loving this one because it looks as if the person has, the educator, has admitted he might need that, 
but I'm going to be honest with you, we just don't have that here. As a school attorney, just between us chickens, when I'm sitting in an IEP meeting and I hear an educator say, well, let me just be honest here, <laughs> I generally feel the hair on the back of my neck going straight up and I'm thinking to myself, oh, please, oh, please, please don't be honest, <laughs> please, because I know it's probably not going to be good because it's going to relate to something such as resources or the fact that that's just not available here, whatever it might be. The U.S. Department of Ed has said long-standing position is that school School personnel must write an IEP and make recommendations without regard to the availability of services in the school district. The theory is if the student needs it, we must build it and they will come, essentially. The most well-known case, and again, I don't have all of the cases that stand for this proposition in my materials. The uh, materials would be thousands of pages if I did, but the best case scenario here in terms of a real life case is the deal versus Hamilton County Board of Education. It's very well known. And here we had the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals actually focused on taped transcripts of IEP meetings. Uh, that's dangerous in and of itself, but the IEP meetings that occurred between the family and school people um, were taped and transcribed and the court took sound bites out of the tape recorded sessions to find quotes on the part of school administrators and other IEP attendees from the school's perspective who said things such as, quote, we don't do LOVAS here. Now, those of you who are, educate, are experienced in educating students with autism, you know what the LOVAS methodology is. We don't do the LOVAS program here. Someone else said, the powers that be have told us we could never offer the LOVAS program. Someone else said, quote, if taxpayers would pay their taxes in this county, we could afford to provide the LOVAS program. All of those sound bites together, the court ultimately concluded that this constituted a denial of fate because it reflected the school's intent not to consider the individual needs of this particular autistic student. What if the student actually needed the LOVAS program? Everyone had already said they would never do it. And based on those, again, sound bites from tape transcripts, the court ruled that it was a denial of faith because the school people came to the meeting with a closed mind with respect to what the parents really wanted for their child. All right, let's look at our next slide in terms of the next series of scenarios that I'm gonna talk about. Let's look at the first one. Our preschool program is four days a week for a half day for everyone. That's really all these young kids can handle. I, I put this example in, first of all, because there is a case out of Alaska where a special education director actually said that to the parents in terms of a full day program never being developmentally appropriate for preschool age children. But I've also heard this quite frequently in terms of preschool programs for students with disabilities. And it might be because preschool programs were not mandatory under IDA until 1991. And the thought was that preschool age kids, because of where they are developmentally, may not be able to handle a full day program. So what happened in my experience was that school systems were developing half day or half AM PM sessions for preschool age children with disabilities and they became quite cookie cutter. And if that is the case, we have to be very, very careful that we talk about the fact that whatever we might have as our overall blueprint for our preschool programs, it will meet the needs of the child. It will provide the child with meaningful educational benefit because that's really the standard. And we have to train school people, particularly the LEA representative, to facilitate the meeting back to the discussion of the individual needs of the child. We're recommending a preschool program for four days a week for a half day because we believe that is what your child needs to receive meaningful educational benefit. Not that's all we have and this is a blanket policy available or a blanket program available for all preschoolers. In a similar vein, quotes here, but we always do it that way. The flip side of that, we've never done that before and we're not starting now. <laughs> Here's one of my favorites, but my schedule won't allow for that. Now whose needs are we talking about? So 
someone needs to make sure at that IEP meeting that we facilitate that back away from the teacher or the service provider's schedule, I find this a lot of times, well, my caseload won't allow me to do that. That's not the question. The question is, does the child need that in order to receive meaningful educational benefit? So to facilitate out of that trouble spot, the LEA representative might say, well, we understand the demands of your schedule, but in terms of what you're offering, does that meet the individual needs of this child? Will it afford this child meaningful educational benefit, rather than making it look like the recommendation is based on someone's schedule? Proceeding on, my class doesn't have those services, but all of our autistic students get blank, get this, that. Anything that's cookie cutter is going to be very, very dangerous. And it will be a quote that comes up later in due process if we should have the unfortunate opportunity to be there. All right, let's look at our next do, number three. Do ensure that required school staff are present at IEP meetings. This is a procedural violation that I unfortunately as a school attorney see more often than I would like. And I often feel frustrated with it because I think it's one of the easier ones. Predetermination and focusing on individual needs and saying things that have legal implications, those aren't as clear, I don't think, to educators. But this one's pretty clear. We know who we need to have at IEP meetings, and we need to do the best we can to not create a unnecessary red herring by having the wrong people attending an IEP meeting. In my materials, I actually have from the law itself the list of members of an IEP team. And there you will see, of course, number one, the parents of the child are listed. Interestingly enough, it wasn't until 1999 that parents were listed as number one. Uh, I, unfortunately, I've been around a long time, so I know probably more about this than I need to, but I know a lot of interesting history. Parents were actually listed as number four in the original regulations in the law. They were moved in 1999 from number four to number one. Now, of course, clearly schools can't ensure that parents are necessarily going to always attend IEP meetings. In fact, many times when I'm talking about parent participation and family collaboration and those kinds of issues, the number one question that I get from an audience member is, wait a minute, Julie, our biggest problem is we can't get all of our parents to IEP meetings. So I understand that, and I will tell you that the parents that aren't interested in attending, the parents that aren't interested in participating in the decision-making process, those aren't the parents that I'm concerned with. I'm concerned about the litigious parents, and while they're very few and far between and maybe only 0.1% of the total parents of students with disabilities, they can take up 100% of the school system's time and cost a lot of money in litigation. So we want to dot our I's and cross our T's, particularly in those kinds of situations. But parents are listed as number one, but from the school's perspective, we're only required to make reasonable efforts and document those efforts to give parents an opportunity to attend, and we have processes in place for that. So from the school's perspective, it's mandatory that we invite parents, but we could go forward with a meeting should they choose after reasonable notice and opportunity is given not to come. From the school system's perspective, though, and the required school staff, that's members two through five listed there in your materials. So we start with member number two, not less than one regular education teacher of the child, if the child is or may be participating in the regular ed environment. We have member number three, not less than one special ed teacher of the child, or if appropriate, at least one special ed provider of the child. Sometimes you may only have a special ed provider, such as a speech or a speech language pathologist who's not necessarily a teacher. So that's what that language contemplates. Then we have four, member number four, that is considered in what I call the LEA representative, a representative of the public agency who meets certain criteria there. They must be qualified to provide or supervise the provision of specially designed instruction to children with disabilities, knowledgeable about the general curriculum, and knowledgeable about the availability of resources within the school system. Some school systems and states also require that the LEA representative be someone who is 
able to commit resources on behalf of the school district. Again, in my opinion, the LEA representative from the school district's perspective is the most important attendee in terms of committing resources and determining what can be provided to the child with a disability. And lastly there, members two through five, the mandatory members, an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. And it is noted that this might be a member of the team who's already been described. So let's say the special ed teacher is qualified to interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. The special ed teacher may be serving two roles, but we need to make sure that the special ed teacher knows that. We need to make sure that everybody, all of these mandatory school staff, are not only present, but they, they are aware of and hopefully trained with regard to their role and responsibility as a member of the IEP team. Member number six we're going to talk about a little bit later as well as a discretionary member, but it's also very important someone at the discretion of the parent or the agency who has special knowledge or expertise regarding the child. This might include from the school's perspective related services personnel, uh, those kinds of things, but also may include people that parents bring to meetings that I'm going to talk about in a little while. I also want to note here uh, in the materials, uh, and I flesh this out to some degree, an excusal procedure. As part of the 2004 IDEA amendments, which is the la latest version of the IDEA that we have, which astounds me that we are now going on, or we're actually into the 10th year of the 2004 IDEA's implementation, and we don't know when there's going to be another reauthorization at this time. So we've been living with the 2004 amendments for quite some time. And in the 2004 IDEA, there was this excusal procedure that contemplated that one of the mandatory members two through five from the school's perspective could be excused from an IEP meeting, but it is a rather complicated process. If, if you'll note there in uh, reading these materials uh, later in detail, you'll note that it is complicated in that you're required to get in writing parental consent or parental agreement, and those are differently defined, depending on who you are asking to excuse. And it's also important to note that the excusal procedure applies if excusing one of these mandatory members from the whole meeting or part of the meeting. So if someone should come in late, let's say if the regular ed teacher comes in late, there must be an excusal process that follows the law in terms of obtaining parental consent or parental agreement in writing, it is contemplated that that would be done prior to the meeting. Um, and if particularly that person's area of the curriculum or provision of service is going to be addressed at the meeting, the parent has to actually provide written agreement uh, and written consent for that. If the meeting involves a modification to somebody's service delivery and they're not there, they're also required to put their input in writing and provide it to the parent and the other IEP team members prior to the IEP meeting. It's very complicated. The excusal procedure is riddled with its own internal landmines, procedural landmines in and of itself so much so that most of my clients and many educators that I talk with and work with across the country have decided that they just don't use the excusal procedure. It would be very, very rare. Many would prefer to adjourn the IEP meeting if one of the mandatory members cannot be there and reschedule it. However, I do see a problem, a little bit of a problem with that on some occasions, particularly if the parent is there and says, I'm prepared to go forward without Mrs. Jones. I, you know, it took me two weeks to get off work today to even be here. I would like to proceed. For that reason, I advise that school districts at least have some sort of excusal procedure and documentation ready should the parent desire to go forward without one of those mandatory members. Very, very important. And if we're, again, going to excuse someone early or they come in late, we need to be prepared to follow the excusal procedure and document that we did so. Now, with respect to this issue and uh, 
generally, and those of you who, who know me out there, know that I could spend a whole day on these do's and don'ts. Uh, so it, it was difficult to sort out which ones I wanted to talk about. And I generally have tips with respect to all of the mandatory members, but we don't have time to go over them. So I decided in terms of our scenarios, we would talk about the two that I see the most questions on with respect to Number one, the LEA representative, and then secondly, the regular education teacher. We seem to have the most difficulty, and we see those popping up in the court cases most frequently. So let's look at our first scenario here with respect to team membership and mandatory members and deal with the LEA representative first. So the quote that I have here for our scenario, yes, I am the LEA representative, but I don't do special ed. You'll have to ask someone else because I, I really don't know anything about it. Well, first of all, I always like to say when I'm training LEA representatives and others, LEA does not stand for Least Experienced Administrator. Let's make that real clear that LEA stands for Local Education Agency Representative. And remember, when we send someone as an LEA rep to serve at an IEP meeting, we need to be sure that they are comfortable with and have been trained with respect to their qualification. This quote here, if said, means that the LEA rep that's been sent to that meeting is the wrong person. Because if you'll remember, back in the materials when we went over member number four, the LEA representative is required to meet certain qualifications, certain criteria. They must be qualified to provide or supervise the provision of specially designed instruction to children with disabilities, knowledgeable about the general curriculum, and knowledgeable about the availability of resources in the school system. And again, some school systems say this person should be able to commit. So the fact that this LEA representative in my scenario has said, I don't do special ed, you'll have to ask someone else, I don't know anything about it, has just revealed that they don't meet the criteria. Someone who is qualified to provide or supervise the provision of specially designed instruction to children with disabilities. I had a case one time, and in the hearing, the parent attorney's first witness was the person who signed as LEA representative on the pivotal IEP that, at issue in the, in the hearing. And as uh, parent attorneys often do, they will call school folks to the witness stand first. So this was the first person who happened to be an assistant principal who signed on the line as the LEA representative during the IEP meeting. And the first question that the parent attorney asked the assistant principal was, so this is your signature as the LEA representative? The answer was, yes, it is. The next question was, so you're qualified to provide or supervise the provision of specially designed instruction to children with disabilities. And the, the assistant principal sat back in her chair and she said, absolutely not. <laughs> so we took a little break and we talked a little bit about that, and that was probably not the worst part of that case. So we ultimately settled. We had lots of procedural violations, but that told me that we needed to do a little bit of LEA rep representative training in that district so that that would not happen again. And you can see there is a case in your materials where the court voided two IEPs merely because there was no one at the meeting serving in the role as an LEA representative. All right, let's look at our next scenario. And again, I get lots and lots of questions with respect to this individual participant in IEP meetings, and that would be the regular education teacher. Now, a little bit of background before I get into the scenario and the quotation here. A lot of regular ed teachers after going to that first IEP meeting are saying, why in the world did I have to be here? And I always like to remind them that Regular ed teachers were added as a mandatory member, and I think a statement was being made by Congress and the U.S. Department of Education by making the regular ed teacher member number two right after parent, saying you are important, regular ed teachers, to this process. So much so, really, Congress was responding to the demands of teacher union groups who were lobbying to have regular ed teachers added to the team membership. This was all part of the 1997 IDEA. And it's sort of that old adage, you better watch what you ask for because you might get it, which is what happened here. <laughs> but in any event, as of July 1st, 1998, any IEP developed on that date or after had to include the participation of a regular education teacher 
if the student is or may be participating in regular education. So let's look at this quote and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Sorry I'm an hour late, but the principal just told me I needed to be here because I'm the only regular ed teacher left in the building. I'm not really sure what help I can be since I don't teach special ed, so can I go now? This is what some refer to as the sign and go or the drive-by IEP team member. Someone who pops the head in and says, hey, how's, that, how's it going with everybody? Do you need me for anything? You know, I'm just a regular ed teacher. I can't really help out here, so can I sign and go? That's very, very dangerous, particularly if the issue at hand is the child's participation and the level and extent to which that's appropriate in the regular classroom. So we have to be very, very careful to bring regular ed teachers into this process and train them. I have trained numerous regular ed teachers across the country, and when I do, I can't tell you how often they come to me and thank me for providing the training, saying things like, wow, I didn't really know I was a mandatory member of that team. Number two, I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing there, and that's why I brought my walkie-talkie that kept going off during the meeting and I had to keep checking on bus duty, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. It doesn't, number one, meet the spirit of the law, but secondly, can really upset a parent who feels like that regular ed teacher is completely disinterested. So it's very, very important to train our pivotally important regular education teachers. You can also see here in the materials, there are a couple of cases, the Arlington case, where a federal judge in New York basically said that the absence of the general ed teacher at the IEP meeting denied FAPE in and of itself and awarded tuition reimbursement for private schooling to the parents. They had decided to place the child in a private school. And the failure to have a regular ed teacher at the meeting was enough, the court said, under the rally theory, prong one, a procedural violation in and of itself that constituted a denial of free appropriate public education. Then we have the ML case, a very similar situation where the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals called the failure to have a regular ed teacher present a critical structural defect in the IEP team process, sufficient in and of itself to constitute a denial of free appropriate public education. The RG case, very similar, the Duraco case. The Duraco case I want to mention merely because they had a regular ed teacher there they just had the wrong regular ed teacher there. And what's important here is the language in the law itself that says a regular ed teacher of the child. I remember when this provision became uh, effective in the 1997 law, became effective in 98. Many of the special ed administrators that I work with said, there's no way we're going to be able to get regular ed teachers to meetings and make it mandatory. So I think I'll just hire someone with regular ed certification, and it will be their job to attend IEP meetings as the regular ed teacher. And I said, hate, hate to burst your bubble there, but the law says teacher of the child. So the problem is if you just hire someone with regular ed certification, that person's not going to fit the bill. It has to be a regular ed teacher of the child. And there's been so much litigation on this that the U.S. Department of Education actually gave us some clarification years ago with respect to the regular ed teacher and which regular ed teacher of the child needs to attend. And they said, well, it doesn't need to be all of them, but it does need to be someone who has served as a regular ed teacher for the child in the past or may potentially be the regular ed teacher for the child uh, in the future uh, under that IEP. In this particular DiRocco case out in New York, the regular ed teacher was a math teacher who had taught 10th, 11th, and 12th graders math, but the IEP meeting was being held to develop a program for a student who was entering high school as a freshman. So there was no way that that was the right regular ed teacher to be present at that meeting. But as I said earlier, remember, we talked about the fact that not every procedural violation in and of itself is a denial of free appropriate public education, and thank goodness for that. So it is considered on occasion, as it was in the Duraco case, a no harm, no foul scenario. But from a, a lawyer's perspective, from a school attorney's perspective particularly, I would just assume we not have these errors because they become red herrings. While the school board didn't lose this case, 
it still was an awful expensive lesson to learn to have the right math teacher there at that meeting. All right, now let's move to our fourth do or don't. This one is a don't. Don't number four, don't prevent meeting participation by individuals brought to IEP meetings by parents. I tend to call these the parent invitees, and this is just another angle on parent participation. Again, very, very important in terms of making sure that parents feel like they are part of the process. And if they bring individuals with them, that we provide them, as educators, sufficient opportunity for input. I will say a couple of things about these, what I call discretionary individuals. From the parent's perspective, these are supposed to be people who have knowledge or special expertise regarding the child. And I get a lot of questions about, well, who determines when this person has knowledge or special expertise about the child? And the only answer that we've ever really had to this was from the U.S. Department of Education in some old, old commentary where they mentioned that, well, for lack of a better answer, whoever invites the person has decided that that person has knowledge or special expertise regarding the child. So there are not very many occasions where we can absolutely bar a parent from bringing someone based on the fact that we don't think that person has knowledge or special expertise. If the parent thinks that person has knowledge or special expertise, that should be sufficient. I will mention just as, a, just in a, as an aside, that also applies to schools too, though. Schools get to decide who they will bring to the IEP meeting, but of course we are required to give notice to the parent of those people that we believe are knowledgeable with special expertise who are going to be invited to the meeting. But from the perspective of parent invitees, who might these folks be? What kind of invitees uh, might we see parents bringing uh, to IEP meetings? I will say that the, the first IEP meeting that I went to uh, in my uh, youth and not really even knowing what IEP stood for, I went kind of doe-eyed into an IEP meeting that had no fewer than 36 people there. So sort of sky's the limit in terms of the folks that parents and or school people can invite as a discretionary member of the IEP team. Sometimes we see attorneys. So let's look at our first scenario. You can't bring your attorney mom with you to the meeting. Well, what about this? Can attorneys be invited to IEP meetings? I will say as a school attorney, I do not feel like attorneys have any business at IEP meetings, but I will tell you parent attorneys often disagree with me. So many times I have sat through IEP meetings where there was a parent attorney present. In fact, I will not attend an IEP meeting typically unless the parent has insisted on bringing their, their attorney to the meeting. That's kind of my standard practice. I don't attend unless I need to be there because the parent has insisted on bringing a, a, an attorney to the meeting. Less and less do I see attorneys at meetings, but in terms of whether or not they can be present, the U.S. Department of Education has commented back in 1999 as part of the regulatory process in 1999, the 97 IDEA reauthorization. The USDOE was asked whether or not attorneys could be added to IEP teams as other individuals with knowledge or special expertise. Would it be appropriate to try to bar an, an attorney? How do we determine whether an attorney has knowledge or special expertise? And again, the U.S. Department of Education said, well, parents generally make that decision if they believe their attorney has knowledge or special expertise. But I found it interesting that the U.S. Department of Ed also noted, and it's quoted in the handout that you've been provided, that the presence of the school district's attorney could contribute to a potentially adversarial atmosphere at the meeting. And I would like to say, well, I think any attorney at a meeting would potentially create this adversarial atmosphere. But they go on to say the same is true with regard to the presence presence of an attorney accompanying the parents at the IEP meeting. Thus, they strongly discourage attorneys at IEP meetings. In fact, the regulations today actually say that if a parent prevails under the IDEA in a proceeding, let's say we've had a due process proceeding, 
they will get their fees, but they will not get their attorney's fees reimbursed for any time an attorney sat in an IEP meeting. So a lot of attorneys, when the law was changed in 2006 in that regard, basically the attorneys decided, well, we, we just will no longer go, we'll just prepare. But in some states and some areas, I still attend IEP meetings because the parent attorneys are still there as well. But we can't bar attorneys from meetings. We have to figure out a way to go forward with the meeting. I will say that the co most common question that I, that I get is, what if an attorney shows up that we didn't know was coming? The parents didn't tell us. All of a sudden, we arrive that day, and their attorney shows up and announces, you know, I'm an attorney, hands out the card, and we're all intimidated. Do we have to continue? And this is my position as a school attorney, and I know that there are other opinions, certainly, and there's no law on this. My general rule of thumb is, in general, I believe that school folks have the right to be represented, particularly if we were not notified ahead of time by the parent that they were bringing their attorney. So in my view, I think certainly the school staff in attendance has the right, if they choose, if they feel they need to do so, to adjourn that meeting and reschedule it when the school board attorney can be present. And that's my general rule of thumb, and that is my rule of thumb because my view is if there is an attorney at an IEP meeting that the parent has brought in, something's up. We need to be careful. I find many times the parent attorney is merely doing what I call discovery to determine whether or not there's some good points in the case, maybe set up school people to say some of these things that I've talked about uh, already, maybe something predetermination of placement-wise or something such as that. So I just view the school attorney as essential most of the time. But I know that in large, large school districts where there are a lot of parent attorneys at meetings, the school board attorney can't possibly attend all IEP meetings. So some rules have to be developed in that regard. But my general rule of thumb is if the school people feel uncomfortable in any way proceeding, they can adjourn that meeting until such time as their school attorney can be brought in as a, an IEP team participant. All right, let's look at the other kinds of folks that parents might bring with them to IEP meetings. The next scenario, sure, your next door neighbor can come but can't participate today. <laughs> well, that's clearly going to be a problem in terms of parent participation and input. If they've brought somebody to the meeting, obviously they brought them as a participant. And I encourage school folks to find out who these people are, whether it's a next door neighbor, Sunday school teacher, private physician. Now, I will tell you, private physicians generally don't have the time to come to IEP meetings, but they certainly like their input. So I'll, I'll see them even write on the prescription pad, I hereby prescribe an IEP for this child, or I prescribe a one-to-one -one aid for this child, or a 504 plan, or whatever it might be. I find that kind of humorous. but. Uh, that input still has to be considered, even if they're not present. But whoever parents bring to the IEP team meeting, I encourage school people to make sure we know who these folks are. I had a case recently where there weren't lawyers at the meeting, but the parent brought some people, consultants, with her. And we were sort of debriefing after the meeting, and I was talking to the special ed administrator, and she said, well, there was this woman sitting there the whole time that the parent brought. And I said, well, who was she? Well, we don't know. <laughs> You didn't ask. We should always ask who those folks are that are in attendance with parents. If nothing else, just to find out how they intend to participate. What is their role in the child's life? What do they know about the child that will help the team make good decisions? Rather than someone who may just be a paralegal who is attending on behalf of a law firm, which I have seen happen, who doesn't identify him or herself. We need to ask those people who they are. I've even had a situation where an attorney showed up and did not reveal that he or she was an attorney. So if there's any suspicion, I encourage school folks at the IEP team table to make sure they are aware fully of who that person is that the parent has brought in to participate. I feel like not only do we have a duty to do that, but a right to do it because we're talking about confidential information during a child's IEP team meeting. So we see all kinds of folks coming along, uh, and we smile at them, we welcome them, 
we offer them the opportunity, the equal opportunity to participate, knowing, though, however, that the relationship remains the relationship between the parent and school people. I had one situation where an advocate had not prepared herself to attend the IEP meeting with the family, and she was taking positions that were clearly counter to what the parent thought the child needed. And in fact, the body language was so palpable that the school people noticed it. And any time that happens, you should always turn to the parent and say, are you in complete agreement with that? I see that your body language is telling me that perhaps you don't agree with what was just said. We need to work with you in terms of and get your input in terms of our ultimate recommendations for services for your child. So I encourage school folks to make sure to check in with the parent, notwithstanding what their invitees might have to say. All right, let's look at the next one. Generally, as I have said, we open our arms to all of the various and sundry people that parents may bring with them to an IEP team meeting. But I will draw the line if the person the parent brings along has the action news camera on their shoulder so that they can show it, show the IEP meeting for the early news program or whatever it might be. In my view, I can't envision a member of the press as a knowledgeable person there to help the IEP team come up with an IEP, an appropriate program for a child with a disability. There is an OCR decision that I've listed in my materials noting that the school district there was justified in terminating the IEP meeting where a newspaper reporter showed up at the request of the parent. Clearly, in my view, that is not a knowledgeable person. That person is there merely to report on TV or in the paper what happened at the IEP team meeting, which is highly, to me, inappropriate. I don't believe that Congress ever envisioned an IEP meeting as a media circus. <laughs> and in fact, because of the confidential nature of the information that's being presented during an IEP meeting, I would advise school folks to clearly um, adjourn that meeting and refuse to proceed. To me, it would take an order from a hearing officer, a due process hearing officer, or a court that we must proceed. Now, here's where it gets sticky because I have had a couple of cases where the parent, him or herself, was actually a news person. <laughs> but they were not there in their role as a news per person or a member of the press. They were there as a parent. As an aside, I've also had parents who also had law degrees in terms of whether or not we can proceed without the school attorney. And again, I leave that to the discretion of the team, how they're feeling, whether they're comfortable about comfortable with that. If the parent, uh, the parent who is an attorney the parent hat falls off during the meeting and the attorney hat goes on, then it might be within the discretion of the team to adjourn. Same goes with the reporter as well. Is that person in the capacity of a parent and acting in the capacity of a parent, or does this person have a microphone in someone's face trying to film them for uh, or record them for the morning radio program? So a lot of these kinds of things school systems hopefully won't encounter very often, but need to think about. All right, let's look at our next scenario. The quote here, sorry, you're going to have to leave because we weren't notified ahead of time that you were coming. Well, the question is, do parents have to notify? Does the law require them to notify school folks ahead of time with respect to who they might be bringing? Well, the answer, easy answer to that is no, it does not. So again, they can invite all kinds of folks and do not have to give notice to the school folks with respect to who they are bringing. However, we can ask them to tell us ahead of time. In 1999, the regulations were changed to provide a change in the invitation to the IEP meeting. And the invitation to the IEP meeting not only has to invite the parent and give a date and a time and location and purpose of the meeting, but also has to notify parents that they have the right to bring these people with knowledge or special expertise to the meeting with them. And I have advised in working on form development and revision with clients, that's a perfect place to say, and oh, if you are bringing somebody, could you please let us know ahead of time so that we can make proper arrangements, room arrangements, and those kinds of things for people you may be bringing. Please let us know ahead of time. It's a great place to ask. I was working with a special ed director one time 
And she was developing this very fancy form, the invitation to the meeting, and it had a little clip-off or cut-off space at the bottom that the parent could mail back in that said, yes, I will attend the IEP meeting, and I will bring blank. And there was a space there for a parent to fill in who they might be bringing. And one particular parent filled that out and said, I will be, be coming, and I will bring cookies. <laughs> and I thought, that is a wonderful story. If we had more cookies at IEP meetings or casseroles and all those good things, our meetings would go a whole lot better. Of course, the special education director was very annoyed because she was going to have to redo that form and make it clear to parents that I don't mean food here, I mean people that you might be bringing. But, I, you know, we got to have a sense of humor in this, in this area. I know those of you who are special ed administrators know that you can't get through a day without a really good sense of humor. I realized that my very first year in practice, that if I got too emotionally entrenched and too involved in some of these things and lost my sense of humor, I would not make it as a special ed attorney. So I like to tell humorous stories along the way as well. All right, let's look at our next scenario. This one comes up quite a bit because a lot of people think that, wow, with all these people we can invite to IEP meetings, if I bring enough people, we can vote at the end of the meeting and I'm going to win the IEP. Well. Let's look at our quote here. Okay, since everyone's still here, let's just take this to a vote since we can't seem to agree. Now, this touches on a different perspective on this particular topic in terms of invitees, but it's important. Because I do find that a lot of times parents think that if they bring more people than the school's going to have at the meeting, then they will win the IEP. In the same vein, I have found a school principal who says, I'm going to stack the deck. I'm going to bring the nine people that support my position. And when we vote on this thing, I'll win the IEP. Well, that isn't how the IEP process works. The U.S. Department of Education has specifically said that the IEP team decision-making process is not a voting procedure. Rather, it is a consensus building process. Consensus, when you look at that in terms of the def actual definition, means unanimity in some dictionaries. So we're trying to work toward unanimity on all aspects of the decision-making process during an IEP meeting with respect to all of present levels, student profile, goals and objectives, services, least restrictive environment, all of those kinds of things, we all work toward consensus. But at the end of the day, the school staff at the meeting is going to be ultimately responsible for proposing the IEP. Here we've worked with you, parent, and your 15 people that you've brought with you, but at the end of the day, here is what we believe is necessary to provide fate to your child. Here is the proposed IEP. And under the law, then, the parent can consider that proposal and decide whether to challenge that proposal. Now, I will add here, because I'm sure there's some California folks listening in and maybe even in some other states, where there are some state rules that don't allow a school district to proceed if a parent does not agree without requesting a due process hearing on a certain issue, putting the onus on a school district to request due process. But the federal scheme puts the onus after receiving reasonable notice of a proposed IEP, puts the onus on a parent to request a hearing challenging what the school system is proposing to do. So it depends on what kind of state you are in. That's very important to keep in mind. But at the end of the day, it is never a voting procedure. In the Sackett's Harbor case listed there in your materials out of New York, the special education director at the IEP meeting actually took things to a vote when they couldn't agree on services to be provided to a particular autistic child. But when the people raised their hands during the voting process, the special ed director refused to count the votes of the people that the parent had brought to the meeting. When the parent filed her lawsuit, the court made it very clear that the IEP process is not a voting procedure. However, since the special ed director took it there and took it to a vote, the court sent it about back for a recount saying, parents, you win, because the parent had more people there. Again, I tell everyone, Please don't talk about the IEP process as a voting procedure. It is not a voting procedure. Just a little humor here. My friends in Florida, I always kill them, kid them that, kid that, that uh, voting doesn't work well in Florida anyway, so don't do it. But they don't find that to be too, too humorous, but I think it's kind of funny. 
But anyway, can you imagine hanging chads at IEP meetings? Well, no, no voting. We don't outnumber um, from the parents' perspective or the school's perspective. The team works collaboratively in an effort to meet to reach consensus. All right, now let's tackle our fifth and final do, and that is a content do. Remember. Back when we started, I went over the process content standard that I see clearly enunciated in the Rowley case, and I could not provide you with five do's and don'ts without looking a little bit toward content. While my practice is very process-oriented, it is becoming more content-oriented as the whole field of special education is moving toward looking at accountability. and more away from process, though process is always going to be vital, um, but looking at outcomes for students with disabilities and actual accountability. And there's been, a, as you all know, a huge shift um, in the focus in terms of really looking more to accountability and outcomes versus the uh, clipboard uh, do's and don'ts related to process. So I, I picked one that I see uh, most commonly in terms of the challenges that I get regarding content and focusing actually on goals and IEPs. So let's take a look at number five. Do include appropriate and measurable goals in IEPs. Be sure to measure them and change them. I might add, please change them if expected progress is absent. So let's take a look at this, and, and I will say also, too, the third in this webinar series that will be presented by Dr. Alan Coulter will focus more on accountability, RDA, the outcome uh, analysis and shift that we're seeing in the field of special education. So certainly stay tuned for that one. But in terms of legal challenges to IEPs, this is the most vital. There are a lot of content. Uh, do's and don'ts that I have, but this is the one that I selected for today because it's sort of on the top of my list as I am working to defend a particular district's proposed IEP in a FAPE case. So let's look at some of our scenarios here. Our first one, the quote here, I'm not really sure where this student is functioning right now in this particular area, in this particular domain, but i got to write a goal for it, so I'll just take a guess. Well. This school attorney is, has never had a, a, a very good record of defending things that are based on a guess. And I can tell you that courts do not feel comfortable deciding special education cases generally. I find that courts are always looking toward expert assistance. They're looking toward solid data that indicates that a child is actually progressing, if I'm going to demonstrate that second prong of rally, whether the child is receiving meaningful educational benefit, as this IEP reasonably calculated to enable the child to do so, I'm certainly going to need to be ready with my hard data with respect to the progress the child has been making in the program that I'm defending. And if I don't have that data, I'm in poor shape to be able to defend that we have been providing FAPE to a particular student with a disability. And I believe as an attorney, and I'm not necessarily an, ex necessarily an expert in quality control in terms of writing good present levels of performance. Uh, many refer to those as present levels of educational performance, present levels of performance by acronym PLIPS and PLOPS. <laughs> Whatever we call those, those are vital to demonstrating that a child is me making meaningful educational progress. And the Kirby case that I've listed in your materials, and there are many, many other cases that also focus on how important it is to document the present levels of performance. Because essentially what the courts were, are saying is that if you don't know where the child started in this particular domain with respect to this critical skill area. If you can't articulate the present level when you develop the IEP, how are you going to demonstrate 
to the parents that the child has progressed, and sometimes evenly as importantly, how are you going to demonstrate that to a hearing officer or to a judge in a litigious situation? So present levels to me are the starting point for developing the measurable goals and the benchmarks, short-term objectives and benchmarks where appropriate in a student's IEP. So that's the starting point and you need to do really, really good training for special education teachers and other service providers with respect to the importance of present levels, what the role of a present level is, why they need to articulate where the child is and have good, solid, updated, evaluative and other data upon which to base the present level of educational performance. It's not based on a guess. It's not based on informal observation or just a feel from the teacher based on his or her experience. We need to have data to support the development of present levels in the critical skill areas and or domains identified by the IEP team as important for the child. All right, let's look at our second scenario here. Well, he's making progress on these goals. I just know it. Well, I sure wish just knowing it was the test. If I could put witnesses on the stand and they could turn to the judge and say, it is so because I know it, I would probably win every case. But unfortunately, that's not the way it goes. As I said again, judges are very uncomfortable making decisions about the needs, educational needs particularly, of students with disabilities. So it's kind of like that movie on Jerry Maguire, show me the money. <laughs> As a school attorney, I mean, show me the data. Show me how you know that the child is making progress on these goals. First of all, then, that means the goal needs to be measurable. Because if a, if a teacher responds to me when I say, show me the data, and they say, well, I just know it, I don't really have anything, I'm very concerned about being able, as a school attorney, to demonstrate the progress on the goal, but more importantly, I'm also concerned about whether the goal is measurable. One thing that worried me, the last reauthorization that we had, as I mentioned earlier, in 2004, eliminated the requirement to include in all IEPs short-term objectives and benchmarks to support the measurable goal. And I was a bit dismayed by that. Now, my understanding was, based on the pundits who supposedly knew and were involved in the lawmaking process, said that they removed the requirement in IEPs for short-term objectives and um, benchmarks to eliminate paperwork burdens and additional burdens for school teachers. And to me, I had I found that kind of uncanny because I had never had teachers complain to me that that was one of the burdens that they had, one of the unnecessary paperwork burdens. In fact, I, as a school attorney, was knowledgeable enough about some of the case law out there to know that many times the short-term objectives and benchmarks save the day when the goal was attacked for not being measurable. The court would say, well, yeah, I don't think the team articulated that goal very well, and on its face it's vague and it doesn't look measurable. But I'm looking here to these short-term objectives, and I'm looking to these benchmarks that are being measured by the teacher, and those make the annual goal measurable. And so I, I was somewhat dismayed as a school attorney when Congress decided to eliminate the requirement for short-term objectives and benchmarks. And interestingly enough, I have a couple of clients that have held on to that requirement just as the, from the school system's perspective, and I know that there are some states that have actually held on to that requirement as well, which I think is advisable based on the series of cases that I have in my materials here. Uh, from 2006 to 2014 cases, you can see where the goals were upheld although maybe vague, maybe very um, general, maybe not as measurable as they should be, but in some of these cases were sufficiently measurable because there were short-term objectives or benchmarks that were being utilized to measure progress on those goals. And then again, there are a couple of cases here that didn't contain appropriate goals at all and therefore in and of itself constituted an inappropriate uh, IEP and therefore a denial of free appropriate public education to the child. 
So if you're interested in that, and I would suggest that you take some of those case blurbs and use them in your training for teachers to give them real-life examples of measurable, the importance of measurability of goals, and then how are you measuring them. Another thing that I will comment on as well is it's, it's one thing to have a good, appropriate, measurable goal in an IEP, but if it's not measured, that's also a problem. Thus, my do here in terms of measuring progress, those progress reports are important. I was actually, as a school attorney, glad to see the requirement for progress reports that track progress on the goals for a student uh, during the year. I was very glad to see that added to the law in 1999 because I felt like too many times it was too late when looking at a child's progress at the end of the year or at the annual review to say, oh, well, look, all year he's not been making the progress that we hoped he would make. But we've had a whole year when we should have been looking at that. And if progress via our progress report is not measured or doesn't reflect that there have been expected gains, then the team should reconvene and address that. All right, let's look at our final scenario with number five. So we're supposed to be writing standards-based goals now. Well, here's our state's curriculum guide. Let's just pick some grade-level goals from it and put it in this IEP. I have seen some confusion, and of course I am, my primary practice is in Mobile, Alabama, and so I have seen where there was a focus or has been a significant focus on writing standards-based goals so that students are insured, students with disabilities are insured that they are participating in the general curriculum. Uh, a mandate for standard, standards-based goals, but being misinterpreted by some teachers uh, and other service providers and educators. So we want to be real, real careful about cookie-cutter IEPs from the perspective of content. I mentioned cookie cutter from a process perspective earlier, but we also need to be very, very careful about cookie cutter type routine. Oh, let's just pick some sort of grade level goal from here. Even, okay, so he should be in the ninth grade from an age and peer, peer grade perspective. So let's pick a reading goal from ninth grade and put it in his IEP. Well, that's not what is intended. And I know that is not what was intended in Alabama, but in the particular case that I have cited here, which is a, a, a case that's not even, or just a little bit over a year old, the Jefferson County versus Lolita S. case, the federal judge was very irritated by the district's use in the student's IEP of what the court called stock goals and services that looked like, well, since he is chronologically supposed to be a ninth grader, the school team grabbed a ninth grade reading goal, planted it in the student's IEP, but unfortunately the evaluative data reflected that the student read at a third grade level. And the court said, this in and of itself clearly constitutes a denial of faith. And it didn't help in this particular case that the court noted that the school team had used the wrong name, uh, used another child's name in the IEP. And I think I mentioned that earlier. That was just a sort of a nail on the coffin in that particular case. But I am seeing a little bit of the, the mandate to write standard, standards-based goals um, leading to unrealistic goals for students with disabilities and things that really are not meaningful for them because there's too much focus on and misinterpretation of the requirement to, to rely on and focus on standards and creating IEPs. Well, that's all that I have to say with respect to our five do's and don'ts. I'm going to wrap it up by giving you an overview of three key takeaways from this presentation. These are just my suggestions. But I think the first takeaway that we can remember from our discussion today is that IEP process errors that deny parent decision-making input substantially somehow interfere with their ability to be an equal participant, those process errors can be 
fatal to the provision of FAPE to a child with a disability, notwithstanding the quality of the IEP. The second takeaway I would like for you to have, keeping the I in IEP is essential. You cannot defend a proposed program if the child's individual educational needs were not the focus of the discussion and the process for developing the IEP. And last but not least, a third takeaway, present levels and measurable goals and measuring them and reviewing and revising where appropriate are essential to demonstrating that the school district has offered free appropriate public education to the child. With that, I understand that staff at Presence Learning has been collecting questions as we've been going along. I'd like to turn it back over to Clay and open things up for a question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julie. We have quite the audience here today, including folks at the New York City Special Education Collaborative. We'd like to thank them for their partnership in this event today. In addition to the Charter Collaborative, we've had over 2,000 registrants for your talk. Um, just an amazing response. Uh, many of these people have sent in questions for you while you've been briefing us and updating us and educating us. So without further ado, here is the first one. Here it is. What about staying out of due process when we are using telepractice? Oh, well, bottom line, and Clay, with uh, I've been sort of uh, monitoring the questions as well. I know they're numerous, so I'm going to try as best I can to keep them brief so that we can get through as many as possible. And when you're using telepractice, I don't think that anything I said today would be any different. It may be, of course, if the modality being used is via telepractice, the therapist who might have a role at the IEP meeting would be included via conference calling or video conferencing. We're seeing more and more of those kinds of things happening as we are moving into the world of, of virtual <laughs> and technological capacity. So I don't think that any of my comments are any different at all as it relates to that. Okay. How do these do's and don'ts that you, you spoke about today apply to virtual schools? Virtual schools still have to keep in mind all of these do's and don'ts. Again, I don't see a difference with respect to whether the public school at issue is a virtual school program or not in terms of these requirements. When I was putting these five do's and don'ts together, I tried to pick the ones that would apply most evenly to all kinds of public schools who are required to make FAPE available. Great. So here we have a question from a charter leader. They say, as a charter school, are we responsible for serving all special education populations, even if we do not have the programs or facilities to accommodate the students' needs? Can we refuse to accept a student because we do not have an appropriate program for that student? Oh, boy. Uh, that's a sticky one and probably the number one question that I get from charter school folks. And I hate to say this and be a little bit corny, as I always am, but uh, that's somewhat unchartered territory uh, to some degree. There are allegations that a charter school should serve all disabilities because to refuse admission would be a form of discrimination. But I can counter that argument by looking at, by analogy, some OCR opinions and, and things such as that dealing with specialty type schools like magnet school programs that have admissions criteria or are designed to meet a special needs of population. So generally, and, and, and particularly if the charter school is publicly chartered and therefore either its own LEA or a public school system, as long as FAPE is made available somewhere for the student, a charter school, after evaluating the student and based on all evaluative data, if it concludes that it would need to fundamentally alter the nature of the school in order to serve the student, then at the end of the day, the decision that the child could not be served at the charter school would be an individualized decision. 
I would never want a, a charter school to say, well, we don't do autism here because that would be discrimination based on disability. But going through the evaluative and then IEP team process and making a decision about what it's going to take to meet the needs, in my view, for particularly special charter schools, they might be able uh, to be successful. Uh, and of course, it's always going to be case by case and looking at each individual situation. But they could be successful in not having to serve the student or uh, rather uh, putting it in other words, uh, deciding that the student's needs cannot be met there and need to be met at another public school. Great. So we have a question here. It's fairly tactical from a district leader. They say, exactly what does schedule an IEP meeting in a timely manner mean? What is timely? Well, <laughs> we schedule IEP meetings when they are requested in a, quote, timely manner. Um, we, we love these kinds of words, especially us at lawyer types, because they're not clear. Uh, things like substantial, significant, timely, reasonable, those kinds of terms. But it, it kind of depends, at least in my view, what kind of IEP meeting we're talking about. If it is an emergency disciplinary per, uh, issue, then maybe a timely manner means in two days, or maybe means tomorrow with notice. Um, certainly there are timelines for convening certain IEP meetings, such as the federal standard requires that once a student is determined eligible, eligible within 30 days an IEP team meeting must be held. But where there are not specific timelines and we're just talking about having meetings in a quote timely manner, certainly that means what's reasonable under the circumstances. And that's my very lawyerly answer to that one. Great. Well, we followed, even though we're not lawyers here. It was great. <laughs> uh, so, look, we, we've got, you, you touched on, um, tangentially, on banks of IEP goals a couple times in this case. Um, and folks here in the questions are wondering, how do we use banks of IEP goals responsibly? I think we all learned we have to keep the eye on IEP, but what are some best practices? Is, is this too dangerous to just, and too tempting to have nearby, or can they be used safely? Well, I, I I don't necessarily have a problem with having sample banks of, of goals. I think it's really all in the training and making sure to train folks that those are merely there for guidance, for ideas, but that they always need to be individualized for students. I mentioned that Lolita case uh, out of Alabama, so I'm especially sensitive to that in terms of having stock goals or having banks of, of goals that then take the eye out of IEP. But I really do believe it's all in the training with respect to how to use those banks of, of goals. Great. Um, we have a few folks uh, in their questions who just want a little bit more specificity. They're asking, hey, how do I apply what you're talking about to my state? And I imagine there's no one-size-fits-all answer, but could you maybe address some of their uh, concerns and, and help them with how to think through that process? Well, I, as I said earlier, I did select five do's or don'ts that weren't terribly specific, that clearly the federal uh, guidelines um, for the most part apply. Now, and so therefore they apply in all states, but there are always some interesting niggles in terms of quirks and things and additions. Uh, I think I mentioned while I was talking about California having an extra co consent requirement in terms of not being able to proceed with things that parents don't agree to during or within the IEP process and having the onus on the school district to request a hearing before going forward. Some of those kind of quirky things that individual states have. For the most part, those states in general, and this is why I'm able to, you know, travel around the country and, and do presentations in various and sundry states. In general, the states stick to the federal scheme because it's already so prescriptive that a lot of states don't want to add. Uh, but there are certain states that have added to the requirements of the IDEA, but I selected these five do's and don'ts so that they would be applicable in all states. Great. We have another tactical question here from a district leader. They say, 
what do we do about parents who never sign invite forms or IEPs? Um, <laughs> well, the law requires school districts to make reasonable attempts to invite parents to IEP meetings and give them the opportunity to participate. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't hear back from parents at all uh, in spite of our efforts, whether they be in writing, phone calls, whatever it might be. Interestingly enough, the law, federal law, says reasonable efforts, and that kind of leaves it to states and or school districts to decide what they believe are those reasonable efforts. And, of course, we are to document those efforts. The traditional uh, procedure that I have seen is the sort of two or three strikes and you're out. We're going to send two notices with a follow-up phone call, document that, and hope that the parent we can get the parents and that they will agree to be a participant. But in terms of... Um, those who just don't, there is no way to force a parent to respond and or to attend an IEP meeting. But I do understand uh, that and, and certainly get a lot of comments with respect to my predetermination and parent participation emphasis. I do get a lot of concerns and comments about, well, you know, our major concern is parents not responding and not attending. And I acknowledge that. And I will say that generally my do's and don'ts don't apply to them. Um, those aren't the parents I'm talking about. Those aren't the ones who are looking out for legal mistakes and are always wanting to participate and always wanting to um, be there and have, have input. So those, those aren't the parents. The absentee parents are not the ones I'm concerned with usually. So I think you could do a whole presentation on this next question, but I'd be curious to hear what you think the highlights are. And the question is this. What are the legal issues related to our obligations involving RTI? Oh my. <laughs> well, you're right about that. That <laughs> the the whole RTI phenomenon sweeping the nation has brought in a lot of uh, of of issues. Um and of course as it was evolving, I as a school attorney had some specific concerns about things and making sure that while RTI is going on and and, and when I at least when I hear RTI, I hear it generically, like Xerox or Kleenex. Um, states use RTI or actually have different names for what they might call RTI, and states are in different different places as it relates to whether it's mandatory or whether it's discretionary, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But as a school attorney, I guess the most important or prevalent legal issue that I've been facing is the one where uh, RTI might, uh, if not implemented if appropriately, might be in co direct conflict with the IDEA's child find duty. Me, that, that is an affirmative duty. And what I mean by that is some confusion that has developed with respect to the mandated RTI particularly when a parent might ask the school system to conduct an evaluation and the response that the parent hears from the school district is, oh, we're so sorry, we can't refer your child for an evaluation because he has not finished RTI. And the mere fact that a student has not finished RTI or the fact that the student hasn't even started RTI is not a legally defensible reason in and of itself to deny a a referral for an evaluation. And so I do a lot of training with respect to those child fine requirements under IDEA that can be triggered by what I call referral red flags, notwithstanding where the child might be in the RTI process. So I would say that that's the primary legal issue that I've been facing in terms of making sure that schools that are implementing an RTI model are not finding themselves denying evaluations based on where the child might be in that process. So we, we spoke a lot about who can be in the IEP meeting. Uh, here's a slightly different flavor of that question and, and around limiting access and who has access to the process. They say, can we limit outside agency access to our classrooms when we get requests from parents for them to observe? Um, I work with school districts a lot that get requests 
um, by parents for their private practitioner, private therapist, whomever, to come in and observe the student. And most of the case authority that I've seen on observations looks at it from the perspective of parent input, parent participation, parent having equal uh, access to information about the services the child is receiving. So for that reason, I generally tell all my clients, we can't absolutely bar observers. But we can have cri criteria, we can have rules that we apply consistently with respect to observations, such as you know, making requests properly, submitting them to certain per persons at the school. Um, it's not, you know, open door, everyone runs in and just observes any time they want. You have to have good policies and procedures related to observations and then apply them evenly to everyone. And that's very, very important. You don't let the parent who's uh, the principal's friend have their private person come in every single day of, of the week for three hours, and then the, the parent that gives the principal the hard time, their person only gets to come observe for an hour uh, once a month. Um, you need to have real good, solid, defensible observation policies in place and apply them consistently. All right. Um, here's another one. When a student's placement is not meeting their needs, what is the recommended way of discussing placement without a specific offer having been made? How do you put, a, put it out there to gauge if the parents are even receptive to the idea without creating a legal nightmare of parents feeling like placement was discussed without a formal offer having been made? Hmm, that sounds like a predetermination of placement kind of question in terms of how do you address options um, for placement without sounding as if something has been predetermined. And there is a fine line there. Um, courts are realistic, though. They understand that people are, as I mentioned earlier, you know, not coming to the table with a closed or, you know, blank mind. I mean, they're People have thought of options before they get around the IEP team table, but generally, um, if there is some concern about perhaps the child needing a more restrictive setting or a less restrictive setting, it probably makes sense to go along the continuum when discussing the options making sure to start with the less restrictive options first and moving along the continuum to the more restrictive settings. But always making sure that whatever you begin your discussions with is is articulated as an option rather than this is it, here it is, that's all we have to consider, um, this is all we're going to discuss, all those kinds of things that I talked about with respect to what might look like predetermination. All right, here's a question on 504 students. What should we know about the legal views for 504 students? Are they still in the book until they're 21, even if they stop attending? What if they don't respond to our letters? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand that question. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that it is a uh, 504 versus IEP and perhaps what the differences right, right. are. Um, wow, that's a whole nother day <laughs> and a whole nother workshop. We can do, um, we can do that after our RTI day. <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, yeah, 504, uh, what I will say, this question is becoming more popular because 504 has all of a sudden become more popular for some reason. And I can't really explain why that is, but there truly are differences in terms of, um, you know, first and foremost, the definition of disability under 504. Now, some of the things I talked about today in the do's and don'ts would still apply. Uh, Office for Civil Rights that enforces 504 is very interested in procedures. In fact, that's what they look at more often than not, are procedural things. They're not going to comment on quality of IEPs or 504 plans. Um, they are more process-oriented, and they're very interested in ensuring that parents receive appropriate notices and things such as that so that they are active participants in decision making. So from the perspective of do's and don'ts, they're probably about the same, but in terms of 
disability and the requirements under 504, they're, they're, they are different. Okay. Are school districts required to provide supplementary aids and services during summer school? Oh, summer school. Boy, the school year's just begun and we're already talking about summer school. <laughs> well, um, supplementary aids and services, it kind of depends on what that means. Um, summer school for children who are IDEA-based could be extended school year services, which is a whole nother, um uh, issue in and of itself in terms of the legal aspects applicable to extended school year services. Um, but if a student with a disability is just attending a summer school program and they have the equal right to and are eligible for attendance in a summer school program, then certainly the school district will need to consider any accommodations the student might need as a matter of 504. If it's extended school year, it's a little bit different because it's an extension, so to speak, of some services in the IEP, and that might be, quote, supplementary aids and services. But, quote, supplementary aids and services, unquote, could also be something required under 504 to accommodate and allow for equal access to an otherwise qualified disabled child under 504 to a summer school program. Bit on, we touched a little bit on aligning IEPs with the Common Core, but could, could you talk a little bit more? We've got some questions on what are the legal implications around uh, aligning IEPs with the Common Core and updating them and so on. Well, we're going to need to be careful about that, and I, I will say that one sort of um, might require me to look into a crystal ball that I'm not able to focus on right now, but there will be some legal implications and they may be similar to the things that I talked about as it relates to stock goals and standards-based IEPs and things like that because sometimes when we're having this discussion, it kind of runs afoul of the individualization uh, and that kind of thing and what is individually appropriate for one student may not be for another. So I see a lot of legal implications in the works, but we're not really there yet. But there certainly will be some, and I'm not real sure how we're going to deal with that in a way that we feel completely comfortable with at this point. Great. So we spoke a lot about who attends the IEP meeting. I just want to go back there again. Mm -hmm. Does the, if the child is no longer participating in regular education, does a regular education teacher still need to attend the meeting? Um, it, well, okay. The, the, the language of the regulation with respect to attendance of a regular ed teacher, it says if the child is or may be participating in regular education. That's the strict language, and that was as I referenced in my handout there. And if a child, let's say, is not participating in the regular ed environment, the question becomes, do we need to then have a regular ed teacher? And of course, there's not a lot of authority on that. A lot of school districts feel a little uncomfortable not having a regular ed teacher there because it could be argued later on that that was a predetermination of the child's participation in the regular classroom. <laughs> But years and years ago, and there, there, there's just really, all it is is some commentary. Um, it was in a Q&A, an old Q&A document from the U.S. Department of Education. The U.S. Department of Education's OSEP was asked, would there ever be a situation where we would not be required to have a regular ed teacher at the IEP meeting? And OSEP said, it would be rare. But it could happen, and they gave a, an example of, let's say, a child is in a separate day school for children with disabilities, and no one thinks that's going to change in within a 12-month period. And it's not a concern of the parent. It's not a concern of any of the school staff. No one thinks that the child's needs are going to change within a 12-month period as it relates to participation in regular ed. They said that might be a situation where you would not have a regular ed teacher present. The problem with that is I don't feel as secure as I would like to as a school attorney with that. And so I generally say, well, you know what? In 2004, we got the excusal procedure whereby we can go ahead and let a parent know ahead of time that we have not planned to invite a regular ed teacher 
because the child is not participating and we don't expect that and we don't see the child's needs to change in a year but parent if you would like us to invite a regular ed teacher in that circumstance we'd be more than happy to do so because it might be that this is the year the parent now wants to talk about some participation in the regular environment so in general for the most part you are going to have a regular ed teacher at IEP meetings, and it would be very rare that you would not. But I prefer, if we're not going to have one, to go ahead and fill out an excusal form and follow that procedure. So another question on meeting attendees. Could one person represent, represent roles three through five on the list of required attendees? Thus, the meeting could be a total of two out of three people. <laughs> well. You, the U.S. Department of Education has clarified from a federal perspective that one person, let's say the regular ed teacher who has special ed certification and is also the regular ed teacher and the special ed teacher, could serve as both. Or the teacher, the special ed teacher, could also serve as the LEA representative and the one who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. So conceivably, from a federal perspective, yes, one person could wear a variety of hats. But we need to make sure that person knows they're wearing all of those hats and that they serve in that role at the meeting wearing all of those hats and they document that they were serving wearing all of those hats. I, I hesitate a little bit to pile on a lot of responsibilities in an IEP meeting on special education teachers, which I find sometimes are serving in various uh, positions. And while it's fine legally, we have to look at practically if that really is appropriate in our particular district. Now, some states don't allow it. I'm just talking from a federal perspective. Some states may not allow it. Some school districts individually by practice may not allow that either. But conceivably, under the federal scheme, technically, yes, someone could wear as many as three hats. Do related service providers, such as SLPs and OTs, have to be there the entire IEP meeting? From a purely federal perspective, those members, and I, as, I, as I said, members two through five that are listed in my handout and in the federal regu regulations are mandatory members. The discretionary mem members are members in, described in number six, and they specifically, the federal regs specifically say, including related services personnel. Now, if a speech therapist is also the service provider and the only one providing services, that becomes the teacher or service provider. So that person would need to be there. But related services personnel, OTs, PTs, and speech that's in conjunction with special education services, those are related services person personnel. So under the federal regulations, they are not required members of the IEP team. However, there are some states that make them required, and there are some school districts in practice that prefer that they be considered required. But purely from a technical perspective under the federal regulations, they are not required. They are discretionary members included as people with knowledge or special expertise. As a matter of best practice, however, if we're going to an IEP meeting and the issue is occupational therapy services, then as a matter of best practice, I would prefer the OT was absolutely there. Great. So we have a question here on the LEA rep. People want to know, can it be a principal or school psychologist? Maybe you can answer this question, Julie, just by giving some examples and helping people understand exactly what the requirements are. The LEA representative, in my view, is probably, from the school district's perspective, liability and otherwise, the most important person at an IEP meeting, so I'm glad that was asked. Many times those folks are sent as the LEA representative and they have no idea who they are and what their role is supposed to be. And I see this person as actually the manager of the meeting. And when we have untrained LEAs, we have legal issues. Who can be an LEA? We have to go back to the criteria. So my answer is going to be, it depends. 
<laughs> which is probably the most common answer I give to every question. It depends. Uh, because it really does in terms of a psychologist. Do, does the psychologist clearly, is that person someone who is qualified? Are they qualified to provide or supervise the provision of specially designed instruction, knowledgeable about the general curriculum, and knowledgeable about the availability of resources? So that's the, the, the answering those questions determines who feasibly can serve as a LEA representative. And I see counselors going, but they really sometimes don't fit the bill because they are not qualified to provide special ed, nor are they qualified to supervise it. So they don't meet prong one of the criteria. Principals, assistant principals, they should meet the criteria. They should clearly be the ones that serve as LEA representatives. They're qualified to provide or supervise the provision of specially designed instruction, knowledgeable about the general curriculum, and knowledgeable about availability of resources. So it really depends on who, in looking at that criteria, really fits the bill, but making sure that whoever is serving as the LEA representative knows that's who they are. Great. Julie, you have just about as many questions here as attendees. Um, let's try and sneak <laughs> in a, a quick last one here uh, before we have to wrap in the interest of time. Does the individual parent bring to the meeting have to sign the IEP forms? The parent invitees, do they have to sign IEP forms? Well, believe it or not, the law doesn't require anyone to sign an IEP form. Now, some states may require it. I would be surprised by that, but the federal law does not require signatures on IEPs at all. What the law requires is for us to make sure that we have the appropriate people there from the school district's perspective. But many times, the aunts, uncles, physicians, Sunday school teachers, they don't want to sign. So what do we do? We may, in the conference record, staffing minutes, whatever might be kept, we just note that the parent brought so-and-so and, -so and, the, and, and, and that person attended. We can't force parents to sign IEPs. We certainly can't force their invitees to come. But at the end of the day, if you have a collegial meeting and everyone is working together, I don't know why someone would mind signing that they were present and participated. But a lot of folks think that if they sign, that means they absolutely agree or they're somewhat how responsible for it. So I've had situations where in invitees refuse to sign, but there's no mechanism for forcing them to do so. Thank you, Julie, for your wonderful presentation. You shared a wealth of knowledge with us today, and we are all grateful and better off for it. Thank you to all of you who are listening for joining us here at Presence Learning today. Our commitment is to provide high-quality speech therapists, occupational therapists, and counselors to unlock the potential of each and every child. As special education moves from a compliance-focused mindset to one that focuses on results, we here at Presence Learning, as well as all of you in the audience, are asking a lot of important questions. What's new on the legal front? What are the best strategies to build strong ties between families, teachers, therapists, and SPED administrators to drive better outcomes? What does Results-Driven Accountability, or RDA, be for SPED administrators? Our fall webinar series seeks to answer these questions and more from a variety of different perspectives. Please join us on October 28th when Dr. Barry Prezant will discuss the importance of collaborating with families, and again on December 2nd when Alan Coulter will explain, excuse me, will explain Results-Driven Accountability and how it will affect us all. Your feedback on these webinar programs is important to us. At the conclusion of today's program, you'll be directed to a feedback survey for today's webinar. Please know, let us know what you thought. Watch your email for a certificate of attendance and links to the recording, as well as slides for today's program. Please share them with your colleagues. We'll also post a link to the recording of today's webinar and the slides to our webinar online. You can view the recordings of all our webinars at plearn.co slash spedahead. That's P-L-E-A-R-N dot C-O slash sped hyphen ahead. For CEU questions, please email us at ceu at presencelearning.com. For more info or a live demo of Presence Learning's online therapy services, please email us at schools at presencelearning.com. Thanks, and have a wonderful day.